This is going to be Genesis chapter 18. And if you've read this chapter, you know this is where Abraham meets with the Lord and two other angels. And so I just want to give you some facts about angels and the angel of the Lord. In Genesis 18, 1, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sent, sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and, lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So these three men who turn out to be angels have left heaven, where there is a sea of glass. Revelation 4, 6 talks about how before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So what you have in heaven is you got God's throne and then you got a sea of glass. And if you look at Job 38, 30, it says the waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. And I've talked about before how, see, in, in between the third and the second heaven, You've got a body of water there. And on top of that, it's frozen. And that's the, what makes up the sea of glass. And the Bible gives hints that it seems heaven would be a bit chilly if you were up there in the flesh and not in a glorified body. For example, in Job 37, 9, Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and cold out of the north. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breadth of the waters is straightened. It, the Bible seems to hint around that it's a little bit cold up there in the third heaven. So the angels would have left heaven where it would be cold and come down in the heat of the day. And it's nothing to them. So they can withstand the heat. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. They can withstand the cold. They can withstand the heat. And I realize that's speculation and just kind of one of those things you talk about on a rainy day. But Abraham is down there sitting in his tent door in the heat of the day. And here comes three men. Two are angels, and one is the Lord himself. Imagine caring so much about your creation that you'll step down from heaven and talk to your people. And proof, is, proof this is the Lord that comes down is in verse 1, because there the text itself says the Lord appeared unto him. So that's the Holy Spirit telling you that this is the Lord appearing to Abraham. And then in verse 2, Abraham, Abraham bows down to him, and they don't rebuke him for it. That's significant. That shows you. That's another good proof that it's the Lord. Because if it wasn't the Lord, then most likely they would have rebuked Abraham for bowing down to him. Because, you know, other examples were, were Peter. The apostle Peter rebukes Cornelius for bowing down to him in Acts 10.26. Uh, John bowed down to an angel in Revelation 22, 8 through 9, and the angel rebukes him for bowing down to him. He told him to, don't bow down to me, worship God, you know. But Abraham doesn't get rebuked. That's another proof that this is the Lord appearing to Abraham, not just uh, another angel, and not just a regular man. And now in verse 3, Abraham himself even calls him Lord. So in the first three verses, you've got proof that it's the Lord. It says in Genesis 18, 3, and, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So now in verse 4, another angel fact is that although angels are spirits, they can take on physical reality and eat and drink. It says in Genesis 18, 4, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Imagine having the honor of giving water to the Lord himself. Uh, you get a reward for giving one of the Lord's men some water. And I'm speculating, but, I, but imagine what you might get for giving the Lord a cup of cold water in the heat of the day. A Abraham got that opportunity. But it says in Mark 9, 41, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. I imagine Abraham's going to get a pretty good reward. Abraham also uh, gives them a place to wash their feet. Imagine, just imagine the scene. Abraham is going to go and, and, and do all the things that you see new, 
New Testament characters get to do with the Lord. He gave, he gave him a cup of cold water. And now he's going to give them a place to wash their feet, just like that New Testament character, Mary. In John 12, 3, it says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So imagine the honor of giving the Lord a cup of cold water. Imagine the honor of giving the Lord a place to wash his feet. Imagine the honor of having the Creator to visit you, even though Abraham wasn't worthy to tie his shoelaces. Just like John the Baptist in Mark 1, 7 says, And preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So Abraham, he's getting to do a lot of cool stuff with the Lord here, getting to meet the Lord. Abraham gives them some food, a place to wash, and a place to rest. Genesis 18, 4, Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. The, the crazy thing is, they don't even need this stuff. They don't need water. They don't need to wash their feet. They don't need to rest. But the Lord is getting down, getting down on man's level to fellowship with him. Abraham gives him water to wash, water to drink, and a place to rest. That is what the Lord gave you with the Scriptures. He gave you a place to wash, a place to drink, and a place to rest. You can do all three of those things with the Scriptures. And then, Genesis 18, 5, And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do. As thou hast said. So Abraham is going to give him some bread. And it makes sense because the word of the Lord is like bread. So Abraham had been getting uh, his word, the Lord's word, through dreams and visions. So it only makes sense he's going to return the favor and give the Lord physical bread. And this could also picture you giving carnal things in exchange for spiritual things. In 1 Corinthians 9.11, it says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing if we shall reap your... Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So, all this time, the, uh, Abraham's been getting spiritual things from the Lord. Now he's returning the favor and giving him carnal things. And the Lord and his two angels said, Do so as thou hast said. They're, they're completely fine with, with Abraham with what Abraham wants to do for him. It says in Genesis 18, 6, And Abraham hastened into the tent and to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. So Abraham is a wealthy man and has all kinds of food. Notice that the Lord doesn't make him feel guilty for having food. The Lord is the one who gave it to him. And you know all of these commercials that talk about starving children and starving animals. It's true that people are starving as we speak. But you shouldn't feel guilty for what God has given you just because other people don't have it. If you earned your money honestly and bought your food honestly, then the Lord gave it to you. Why do you need to feel guilty for what the Lord has given you? When people try to make you feel guilty for what you have, a lot of times they are trying to manipulate you into doing something. But the Lord doesn't make Abraham feel guilty for having this food and for having these things. In Genesis 18, 7, And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. Notice something else. Abraham calls him a servant. But in verse uh, Genesis 18, 7, And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. So notice something else. Abraham calls himself a servant to the Lord in verse 3. Yet Abraham is a man with servants under him. And you know the story. The Lord is very pleased with a man with authority who will let God be his authority. And once again, Abraham is showing you some, some things that remind us of some New Testament characters. In Luke 7, you got the centurion. And he is a man with great faith. It says in Luke 7, 7 through 9, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, 
but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So the Lord admired the faith of the centurion, and I guarantee you he admires the faith of Abraham. And you see, people with a lot of authority and things like that can be a hard people to get to submit to God's authority. But that just shows you just how great Abraham's faith was. The Lord must have thought Abraham was extremely faithful in this situation. And in Genesis 18.8, it says, And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. So the angels and the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord, ate physical food. This would have been completely for fellowship with Abraham because they don't need food for nourishment. They were just doing it for fellowship's sake. And it's just good to get together and eat with a friend in fellowship. You know, Baptists are well known for getting together and having these big dinners and stuff. And, I mean, that's pretty biblical because look at what they're doing here. Someone asked me once, will we eat in heaven? I believe so because the, angel, the angels are eating, the Lord's eating, and then Jesus Christ even ate in his glorified body in the New Testament in Luke 24, 41 through 43. It says, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb, and he took it, and he and did eat before them. So, the Lord eats in his glorified body even. And not to mention, in Revelation, you've got the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will be in a glorified bodies with the Lord, and he'll be in his glorified body, and we'll be eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it seems we will eat for fellowship and for the enjoyment of it, as we won't be eating to live or anything like that. Genesis 18, 9, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. They already knew the answer. Sometimes the Lord asks things he already knows. And it's like when you ask your kids questions that you already knew the answer to. Sometimes you just do that. Maybe Abraham should have gotten Sarah to come out and feast with the Lord. That's what I started thinking about that when I read that. Maybe Sarah should have came out. Maybe this should remind us that when we eat with the Lord and His Word, that we should get our family involved, if you can. I mean, I know a lot of husbands and wives wouldn't dare get in the Bible with their spouse, but if you can, maybe get the Lord in, or get, get your spouse involved when you go to feast in the Word. Genesis 18, 10, and 11. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Many times people say that what takes place with Abraham and Sarah and them having Isaac isn't actually a miracle because of the fact that Abraham lives to be 175 years old. So, so they think that Sarah would have still, still be able to have a child at 90 just as easy as a 20-year-old today since they lived so much longer back then. However, the Bible says in this verse here, it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. That shows that she couldn't have a child outside of a supernatural miracle from God. This is why Isaac would be a miracle birth. And this miracle birth would picture the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, which is also a miracle. But notice what Sarah does when she hears that you know what the Lord's saying about how she's going to have a child in her old age. It says in verse 12, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Notice once again the the text says, And the Lord said unto Abraham, showing you once again that this is an appearance of the Lord to Abraham. And notice, remember that the Lord asked where Sarah was earlier. This confirms that the Lord knew where she was all along. I mean, he hears her even. And so verse 13 proves the Lord knew exactly where Sarah was because 
he even heard her laugh within herself. This wasn't a laughing out loud thing where, you know, everybody heard it. She laughed within herself. And this is also another proof that it was the Lord visiting Abraham. Like I said, not to mention the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Abraham in verse 13. And then the Lord says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And that is the famous verse, is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, Danny's got that famous sermon, is anything too hard for the Lord, that classic. You know, a lot of good preachers have preached on that verse there. Nothing is too hard for the Lord, as it says in Mark 10, 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, with men it is, it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. If God made Adam from the dust of the ground, then this seems like a a light thing for the Lord. If the Lord caused a virgin to have a baby without a man, then this is a light thing for the Lord to cause Sarah and Abraham to have a child. But then look what Sarah does in verse 15. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. The main reason people lie is because they're afraid. We would probably be afraid in this situation too, but the Lord is the ultimate lie detector. And he knew that she, that she was lying. Genesis eighteen sixteen. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So the men is the Lord and the two angels that were with the Lord. These are the ones you read about first thing in chapter 19 showing you that they're angels. In Genesis 19, 1, And there came two angels to Sodom and even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. So this brings us to another angel fact, and that is angels in the Bible are male. Every time they show up, they're called men or young men or man. And the ones from heaven neither marry or are given in marriage because they are all men. And if they go after a human woman like they did in Genesis 6, then they, know they are no longer the angels of God which are in heaven, but the angels which left their first estate, as it talks about in the book of Jude. They would then reject their place with the Lord and would then be evil angels. In Genesis eighteen seventeen and 18, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? The Lord is about to, to tell Abraham what he's going to do to Sodom. He says, For I know that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Notice the Lord says, For I know him that he will. I know him that he will. The Lord knows what Abraham is going to do with his free will. The Lord has foreknowledge. He knows what he will he knows what Abraham's going to do before he does it. He knows what will happen before it happens. He sees the end from the beginning. He doesn't make your choice for you. He just knows what choice you're going to make. So don't get his foreknowledge confused with, you know, him allowing you to have free will. He knows that Abraham will command his children. He knows that Abraham will command his household. He knows that they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment. So verse 20 says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. You see, the cry could be a number of things. Consider how in Genesis 4 that Abel's blood cries from the ground. In Genesis 4.10, it says, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I mean, they're probably shedding innocent blood in Sodom. Also, search the video of Silent Cry about abortion. Uh, uh, you'll see that the child actually cries in the womb when the abortionist tears the body in pieces. I believe the Lord, I mean, obviously the Lord hears those cries. If he hears Sarah laugh within herself, then he hears the cries of those children in the womb of their, their mother as a wicked abortionist is tearing their body in pieces. And it says... In Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? There were probably victims that their blood and their voices were 
continually crying. And, you know, God is going to get vengeance. And also in that verse it says, because their sin is very grievous. The cry is great in Sodom, and because their sin is very grievous. You remember in Genesis 13, 13, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. This just goes to show you the, the sin of sodomy that was going on there. It's, it's a wicked sin. It's not just, it's not like just all the other sins. It's not like, oh, telling a lie and, and like that. You know, some sins are worse than others. Jesus said, he who hath the greater sin. Not all sins are the same. And Genesis 18, 21, And I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is coming to me, and if not, I will know. Notice that the Lord says he will go down now and see. The Lord could already see. He didn't have to come down to see. He could already see up in the third heaven. But just like back in uh, Genesis chapter 11 and verse 5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. The Lord could already see the city and the tower, but he went down to experience it in a body just like you would experience it. The Lord knew what it would be like to live in a life in the flesh as a man, yet he came down and did it anyway. He came down and suffered anyway. That is just how the Lord does things. He knows everything from the third heaven, but he comes down to experience it and get down on your level. It's like when you play hide and seek with your kids. You already know where they're hiding but you go look for them anyways. You know, you, you play along with them anyways. And Genesis 18, 22 and 23, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And you know, Abraham's not saying, you know, saying this like, saying this in a way like, you know, come on, Lord, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do this thing? You know, this is, this is a sincere question. And sometimes you're going to have sincere questions that come up. And the Lord's not going to get mad at you for asking sincere questions that sometimes seem, you know, like you're accusing the Lord in some way. Abraham is, is worried because he knows that Lot and his family is in Sodom. He doesn't want them to be destroyed with the wicked. So he says in Genesis 18, 24 and 25, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Would thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because no matter what happens, even if something seems like it's going the wrong way or that it shouldn't be or it shouldn't be going a certain way or we feel like the Lord shouldn't have allowed some certain thing to happen, this verse comes to mind that we can always go back to, and it says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I just trust God that whatever happens is for a reason. Whatever happens, the Lord did right by, by doing it, or the Lord did right by allowing it to take place. That's one of my favorite verses. When something comes up, just say, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis eighteen twenty six through 28. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So if, if the Lord, he's like, Abraham, if, the, if I find fifty people, I will, spare, I will spare them. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Abraham admits and knows that he is dust. He came from dust. From dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. And, but he says, Peradventure shall, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. So the Lord won't destroy it if he finds forty-five. So Abraham, he's beginning to be not so confident that there are fifty righteous there, so he goes down to forty-five. And in verse 29, he says, And spake unto him yet again, and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not. And the Lord, you know, the Lord's like, No, I won't do it for forty's sake. So now Abraham's down to forty. And now in verse 30, he's down to thirty. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak for it. Peradventure there shall be thirty found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty. 
And then verse 31, and he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. So now twenty. Now verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Now he is down to ten. And verse 33, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So, obviously, he couldn't even find ten righteous people there. But Abraham stopped at ten. So Abraham had to be counting on Lot to be righteous, Lot's wife, Lot's two daughters, and their husbands to be righteous. But then that's only six people. So he must have even been hoping that maybe Lot had got at least a few converts over there. But the Lord couldn't even find ten righteous people. And this, this story reminds us how maybe God's not destroying America because there's some righteous people still left in this nation. Maybe that's what's keeping America from being blown off the map is, you know, there's still a lot of faithful Christians that believe the Bible still in America. But we'll get back to this next week, Genesis 19. God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see those two angels show up again. But we found some cool facts about angels in here. Some cool facts about how God appears as the angel of the Lord and appears in a body in the Old Testament, a pre incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the faith of Abraham all through this chapter. And, you know, he's, he's a faithful person, but yet, yet he's just like us. He has, you know, his things that's, that's wrong with him, his doubts, his questions. So, we'll, we'll start with Genesis 19 next week.